how can you justify being a black Christian when you know that the Bible condones slavery? But before I answer that question, if you haven't already, go ahead and subscribe to the channel, hit the like button on this video, and make sure you hit the notification bell. All right, so we're in the age of wokeness. And in the age of wokeness, people have been pushing this idea that you can't be black, woke, and Christian all at the same time. Now, the issue of slavery has been a huge stumbling block for a lot of African Americans, causing them to be indifferent to Christianity or just outright rejected. Case in point. This is stuff that, you know, the black church doesn't want to tell their congregations, you know. It's all butterflies and daisies they think in the Bible, but it's not. You know, you see genocide, rape, murder, slavery, every just immoral act of aggression that a human being can think of is in the Bible, and it condones it. For me to be a Christian, knowing my ancestors who were slaves 200-something um, years ago, and for 300 to 400 years, for me to be a Christian would be not only a slap in the face to me, but a slap in the face to my ancestors. Because we all know that Christianity was used as a justification for slavery. And one of the ways that the um, slave masters kept the slaves in line was teaching them Christianity, which, you know, condoned slavery. And it told them that, you know, this is, this is God's law. If you can go to other countries and take slaves and a slave must be, be obedient to his master. Now look up those Bible verses. This isn't something I'm making up. Challenge accepted. Now he said a lot in that video, but is any of it true? All right, so in my next few videos, I'm gonna take a look at each claim that he made, compare it to scripture and see if they match up. Get it? Got it? Good. Claim number one, Christianity was used to justify slavery. This is partially true and it stems back to Genesis 9:25. In Genesis 9, 25, it says, Canaan will be cursed. He will be the lowest of slaves to his brothers. He also said, praise the Lord, the God of Shem. Canaan will be his slave. In this text, we see the curse of Canaan because of Ham's sin against Noah. Okay, so the argument goes something like this. It was common belief that Canaan settled in Africa. So eventually, Canaan became associated with dark skin and now you have the justification for enslaving dark-skinned people. Now, how true any of that is, I'm really not sure. But let's take the leap with them. Let's just assume that Africans were the descendants of Canaan. If we go back to the verse, although we see that Canaan is cursed, he's still considered a brother of Shem and Japheth. But why is that important? Well, it's important because if Canaan is still a brother, then that obviously means he's still a human. But we know that during the slave trade, the American settlers did their best to dehumanize slaves by means of rape, forced incest, denial of basic human rights, and let's not forget the three-fifths compromise. Historian Alec Ryrie puts it this way. The implicit belief of many slaveholders was that Africans were not truly human and therefore not really capable of being Christians. You find slaveholders comparing giving the sacraments to slaves to baptizing dogs or, or giving communion to horses. This sort of thing isn't an accident. But no serious Protestant ever tried to defend that kind of view. What they did do, sometimes making use of the, the scant biblical cover provided by the weird story of Noah cursing his son Ham, what they did do is sometimes try to explain something which most 18th century white observers took as a self-evident fact. That is, that Africans are human in theory, but they seem subhuman or almost bestial. I don't know of any examples in scripture where the Israelites treated their brothers or their slaves like this in a justifiable manner. In fact, many times you'll see the slave masters in the Bible being held accountable for the mistreatment of slaves, but we'll get to that later. So I have a question for people who try to discredit the Bible and or Christianity because of slavery. If a tree falls in the forest, does it make a sound? Aha! 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 Just kidding. No, but for real though. If a person misuses an object, does that mean that the object is corrupt? Or, or does it reveal that the person using the object is either ignorant or corrupt? 
Okay, for those of you who didn't catch that and need a visual aid. Not often that we have such a lovely dinner guest, eh, Eric? Is something wrong with the fork? Or is something wrong with the mermaid? Is something wrong with the gym equipment or is something wrong with the people using the gym equipment? Okay, okay, okay. I think you get the idea. All right, so claim number two was that slave masters kept their slaves in line by teaching them Christianity. That is not entirely true. In his book, Slave Religion, The Invisible Institution in the Antebellum South, Albert J. Rabito gives readers an inside look at the religious practices in the South from a slave's perspective. In a slave narrative from John Brown, he writes, Sunday was a great day around the plantation. The fields was forgotten, the light chores was hurried through, and everybody got ready for the church meeting. It was out of the doors in the yard. Master John's wife would start the meeting with a prayer and then would come the singing. But the white folks on the next plantation would lick their slaves for trying to do like we did. No praying there and no singing. Some masters did not allow their slaves to go to church and ridiculed the notion of religion for slaves because they refused to believe that Negroes had souls. Keenly aware of their inability to read the scriptures, many slaves came to view education with a religious awe and bitterly resented the slaveholders' ban on reading. They just beat them up bad when they caught them studying and reading and writing. Folks did tell about some of the owners that cut off one finger every time they caught a slave trying to get learning. Rabito goes on to say that slaves were distrustful of the white folks' interpretation of the scriptures and wanted to be able to search them for themselves. The reverence which they held for the Bible moved many ex-slaves to flock to schools set up by missionaries after freedom came. Negroes almost worshipped the Bible, and their anxiety to read it was their greatest incentive to learn. Nefernity put it this way. More than physical liberation, Christianity posed, posed a threat in the form of mental and spiritual liberation. You feel me? They recognized that from the very beginning. Um, their fear was that slaves becoming Christians would see themselves as children of God and think themselves equal, God forbid, right? Think themselves equal to European Americans and therefore, you know, kind of attack the whole oppression thing. You slaves know? were enticed to become Christian because Christians couldn't enslave other Christians. So the idea is you would become, you would get baptized and then your master would just have to let you go free. You don't know that's the law. They own, own the law. They got to let you go if you were Christian. Uh, and for a little bit, that was uh, accurate in terms of Christians couldn't enslave other Christians. But that only caused slave masters to masters to want to keep Christianity as far away from their slaves as possible because obviously they don't want to interfere with their own uh, trade. They don't want to interfere with their own income. So they kept Christianity away from slaves. It wasn't an enticement necessarily to the slave masters for them to beat Christianity into us because it would be contrary to their own pockets to do so. To piggyback off of that, listen to Professor Alec Ryrie read an excerpt from a former slave named Jacobus Capitine. In 1742, a book in defense of slavery by Jacobus Capitine, a newly ordained minister in the Dutch Reformed Church, became a bestseller. It ran through five editions within a year. And the, the book's argument is eloquent enough, but its real selling point was its author's story because Capitaine was African by birth. He'd been enslaved himself as a child before being freed and sent to the Netherlands for education, and his ambition was to take the Protestant gospel back to his native land as a missionary. But, as he wrote, some Christians fear that the preaching of the Protestant gospel might lead to slavery disappearing entirely from those colonies which Christians own. And so not wishing to jeopardize their slave holdings, the colonists oppose the preaching of the gospel. So there you have it in a few different sources. To say that Christianity was forced on us or forced on our ancestors really is just a blanket statement. 
The fact of the matter is, slaves often risk their lives and their safety just so they could pray, read the Bible, and go to church. Well, we have reached the end of this video, but stay tuned for more because I am not near done with this topic. Shalom, grace and peace. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel and follow me on Instagram while you're at it, Miss Titus too. Oh yeah, and one last thing. If you haven't already, make sure you go to Nefertiti's channel and watch her full video on Become a Christian or Die. You won't regret it. All right, y'all. Peace.